So this session is with regard to the discussion on uh, NEET SS surgery questions so that we will be able to know what are the answers and uh, how we have gone through that. And uh, I have gone through the entire question paper of 150 questions. Out of that I am uh, working on to get the correct structure almost 60 percent I have got with four options and rest I am just working on to get all the four options right so that the discussion could be more appropriate. So, we will have almost uh, three parts to do this. This will be part one and followed by part two and part three. So, we will finish all 150 that way and uh, the standard is very much with respect to general surgery and uh, I do not see any uh, speciality level superficiality level uh, questions except for two or three questions for every speciality. Other than that, I do not see even that can be answered from to the general surgery itself. And the book for reference is of uh, Bailey and Love and uh, 77th edition and uh, Savistan 21st edition. So, I believe that we have done extensively and except for two questions of this SPM and rest of all 148 questions we have touched up and we have done it completely because more than 80 questions or 90 questions I could see it was targeted from tables of Bailey and, and Subistan. That is the reason why we had separate sessions on tables in Bailey and tables in Subistan. So, it made a huge difference and also from general surgery part there are considerable number of questions and uh, which we could uh, do that uh, during general surgery life. So, the preparation was well within the fort of the exam and even after the exam uh, it remains the same. So, I am very happy that definitely the results will speak for itself and uh, the amount of hard work that has went in from both the faculty side and also from the student side was enormous and that will definitely give good results. So, cut off for this exam I believe could be close to 75 to 80 percent could be the cut off and the paper is not very easy and not very tough it is a moderate size paper that is what my analysis after say 4 5 days now. So, we let us get started uh, with the session and if you feel that uh, the question and options are not appropriate you let me know we will correct during our discussion and find an appropriate answers then and there only ok. So, let us get started. So, I am very sure that speed uh, students would definitely would have an edge would have done uh, better than uh, anybody else because of the kind of training you had. The question reads most common clinical manifestation of your chromocytoma, palpitation, hypertension, headache, vomiting and uh, yes instead of vomiting and I could see that it was sweating, yes it was sweating ok. I am just correcting it. For rest of the options are correct. So, first what you do is you say is the question correct and options right then we get on to the answers. The most common clinical manifestation of your chromocytoma it was well discussed in the class and uh, it was hypertension and if this question would have been the most common symptom then answer would have been the most common symptom if they would have asked a question suppose they ask you in the next exam ok for the upcoming exam if they ask you the most common symptom then it could be number one will be headache number two will be sweating so you should know that ok. So, where is it given so it is very much in Bailey and Love and uh, 27th edition page number 845. And uh, so, hypertension is seen in 80 to 90 percent of patients, paroxysmal 50 to 60 percent and continuous is 30 percent and headache is seen at 60 to 90 percent and sweating is 50 to 70 percent and equal to that is palpitation as well. I mean second to headache the symptoms of uh, sweating and palpitation could uh, occupy the second space. So, just have a, a rough idea and the same table is available in the PPT format in pheochromocytoma chapter itself and you can go through that for completion. So, pheochromocytoma has symptoms of increased sympathetic activity, has an increased sympathetic activity and symptoms and everything will be high tachycardia, palpitation, tremor, increased basal metabolic rate, hyperglycemia, hypercalcemia, 
So, and uh, it will be not uh, weight gain, it will be a weight loss and it will not be a diarrhea. This was also discussed. It will not be a diarrhea. Instead, these patients will have, what this patient will have on bowel? They will have constipation. Okay, these are the two things which are except. So, they will have weight loss, not diarrhea, constipation. Okay, great. So, in a suspected pheochromocytoma, what should not be done? A needle biopsy should not be done in a pheochromocytoma and uh, the diagnosis predominantly depends on biochemical parameters, metanephrines and imaging. Okay, so you know that the drug of choice is phenoxybenzamine, an alpha blocker and the prerequisite for taking for the patient for surgery, the BP has to be brought to 160 by 90. So, some of the important recaps I am just doing so that this could be useful, the session could be useful for the next upcoming exams as well. Okay. So, lipodermatosclerosis is seen in. So, this is a very straightforward and a simple question and it is very, very clear and the hope the options are also clear. Chronic eczema, venous hypertension, peripheral arterial occlusion. Definitely, it will be the answer is venous hypertension. So, the venous hypertension is the right answer. And you know that it is given in Bailey and Love 873 and 27th edition and it is very, very clearly said that lipodermatosclerosis, chronic inflammation, fibrosis of the skin and subcutaneous tissue resulting in tight and contracted and woody leg on examination. It occasionally results in significant contracture of Achilles tendon. Okay. So, it is a sign of chronic venous disease. It is a sign of chronic venous disease. So, the thing that is related to the options here is venous hypertension. Child with a limb deformity, I mean, I do not uh, see an image, I mean, I have not seen the image, but people said, I mean, it could be something like radial club hand, does it correlate because I spoke to some of the students and uh, is that correlation correct? So, uh, this is something to do with that has been uh, discussed in esophagus. Probably you remember that uh, tracheoesophageal fistula, esophageal fistula where uh, we will see a vactral syndrome, vactral anomaly, radial club hand with a longitudinal failure of formation of commonly associated with other malformations, example, vactral. There is uh, abnormal vertebra, anorectal malformation, cardiovascular system, abnormality, congenital heart disease, tracheoesophageal fistula, uh, renal hyperplasia and limb buds. So, the clinical problem depends most especially when there is a thumb present and functional and treatment is the balance of conservative measures including physiotherapy and splinting and, and judicious surgery to centralize and stabilize the hand and the wrist on the single bone forearm. So, there is something like vactral normally. So, it is about a radial club hand. Okay, fine. So, it might correlate with those who have attended the exam and know what it is. So, the most common ectopic location of the kidney. So, it is very, very clear that uh, See, most of the congenital anomalies in the urinary system are commonly seen on the left side, on the left side and kidney as a pelvic organ and ascends to become an abdominal organ, okay. So, unascended kidney is a dropped kidney or an ectopic kidney. So, it is most commonly seen in pelvis, it is most commonly seen in pelvis. If suppose they ask you, most common congenital or embryological abnormality of the upper tract. The answer will be the related, something related to this I will tell you, will be duplication of renal pelvis. Okay. Most common urethral anomaly, suppose they ask you, or lower urinary tract abnormality, the answer should be hypospadiasis. Okay. Usually they ask harshu kidney. <laughs> they usually ask harshu kidney, this time they ask ectopic kidney. Okay. And uh, is the ectopic kidney functioning normally or abnormal? I mean, will this kidney will be live, normal or abnormal? Ectopic kidney are always live, normal. So, then what should be the treatment of choice? 
So an ectopic kidney, what should be the treatment of choice? No treatment, only observation, nothing required. Harshu kidney, the isthmus, the isthmus in a harshu kidney, okay, fuse lower poles, this isthmus is against which vertebra? This isthmus is against which vertebra? L2, L3, L4. I did not ask you about the renal pelvis. I asked you about in a harshu kidney, the isthmus, the fused lower poles is against which vertebra? So, the right answer will be L4. So, what is unilateral S shaped kidney? What do you mean by unilateral S shaped kidney? So, this is something called crossed ectopia, correct? This is something called crossed ectopia, okay? So, pelvis of both the kidney will face the opposite direction. So, this is called unilateral long S shaped kidney, okay? Great. So, this are some of, some of the related points to it. So, fetal kidney arises from the pelvis and ascends to attain the normal position and if this process fails to any degree, the kidney ends up in being the lower normal position. During their ascent, the renal pelvis also rotates uh, facing anteriorly to facing more medially. The most common anomaly is for the renal pelvis is to face anteriorly and more uh, ectopic the kidney, more severe the rotational abnormality. The majority of the cases of renal ectopic, uh, both the kidneys are fused. In a cross renal ectopia, both the kidneys are fused on the same side and the ureters will cross the midline, okay. The kidney which has migrated to the opposite side, okay. So, this will be the urinary bladder. The kidney which has gone to the opposite side, the lower kidney usually migrates, that ureter will cross the midline to open it to the bladder on the contralateral side if this is the midline. So, it is the lower kidney that usually migrates to the opposite side in a cross ectopia, that is what it, that is what uh, this paragraph says. Is it okay? So, the base deficit suggests high morbidity. What is the number? And we discussed earlier that more the number, more the morbidity because more the metabolic acidosis. So, you can see where exactly. See, the very idea of uh, doing this is from where line to line these questions are taken, okay. So, 27th edition, page number 17. So, lactic acid is generated by cells undergoing anaerobic respiration. The degree of lactic acidosis is measured by serum lactate level or the base deficit is sensitive for both the diagnosis of shock and monitoring the response to therapy. Patients with base deficits over 6 moles per liter have a much higher morbidity and mortality than those with no metabolic acidosis. Furthermore, the length of the time in shock with an increased base deficit is important even if all the other vital uh, signs have returned to normal. So, is Aravind is asking, can the midline be the answer for the previous question? Now, see midline in the pelvis, anyway the answer is pelvis, there is no doubt about it. Midline where? Okay, is fused, then in the pelvis midline, if it is fused, okay, the answer is 7, more than 6 is exactly the word to word it is given. See that? Now, this question I was posted, I post in the telegram group to get it completed. Cervical spine injury at uh, different C level presentation and spindle reflex plus pain on the right upper spasticity of both lower lips. Can you structure it? Supinator reflex. Lost. Okay. You just see this table, inverted uh, supinate reflex plus with uh, radicular pain on the right upper limb, uh, which level is a lesion, this uh, question, okay. Now, you just see whether you see whether it is appropriate uh, with the actual question in the exam and will the explanation shoots, you just see it. See, neurological evaluation of the upper limb given in 27th edition page number 473 in Bailey and Love, C5. Uh, the motor will be deltoid and sensation will be the lateral arm and bicep C5, C6. C6, uh, the wrist extensors, lateral forearm, the sensation and brachioradialis C5, C6. 
and C7 triceps middle finger triceps C7 to C8 reflexes. C8 long flexors, okay, long uh, finger flexors, medial uh, forearm and no reflex uh, for reflexes. T1 interosseous, yes, especially uh, medial, uh, I mean, uh, palmar interosse and dorsal interosse, okay. So, inverted supinator reflex, yes. And uh, C5, C6 will not be involved and uh, it will be above, the injury will be above that level, okay. And above, if inverted supinator reflex, no C5, C6 and above. So, and uh, the probably the answer looks like C7. So, the answer will be C7 or C8. If the inverted supinator reflex is positive, if it is given. I think this is inverted supinator reflex positive, correct. What was given? Inverted supinator reflex was lost or present, present or lost. So, you need to take a consensus on that. If it is present, the answer will be C7 for the options given, okay. The risk factor for carcinoma gallbladder all except more than 3 stones. It was least, is it? The risk of uh, CA gallbladder was least. For which uh, anomalous uh, bank reticular junction was there? Polyp was not there. Are you sure? So least risk. No polyp. So instead of polyp, anomalous bank reticular junction. Polyp more than 10 mm was one of the option. Yes. Was the polyp there or not there? For this question, polyp was not there. So, for the options, for the answers, for the options given here, that's all options correct, okay. So, now what do you think is an answer is? See, stone disease has a risk factor. Anomalous pancreatic bladder junction, of course, yes. Postal gallbladder has a slight increased risk. So, the answer has to be between A and B. So, we will choose option A as answer compared to 3 centimeter stone because 3 centimeter stone is a risk factor because I mean how it is a risk factor because it will stay for a very long time in the gallbladder if not treated, if not treated. So, the chronicity could be a problem for 3 centimeter calculus and uh, among the options given here the A option looks better. Okay, option A looks better. So, the etiology is unclear, but there appears to be an association with a pre existing gallstone disease. So, it is given here in Bailey as generalized as gallstone disease. It does not mention the number of stones of the size, suggesting that the chronic inflammation may play a role in a manner similar to the tumors in the bile duct, common bile duct. Calcification of the gallbladder wall, calcification of the gallbladder wall, presumably due to chronic inflammation, porcelain gallbladder, is also associated with a small increased risk of cancer. Chronic infection may also promote the development of gallbladder cancer and the risk of typhoid carriers significantly increased over general population. So, all these are okay. So, among this the better answer looks as option A, okay. The least risk, even does not say there is no risk, it is the least risk. So, gallbladder polyp may also be approximately 5 percent of patients who undergo ultrasonography. So, polyps more than 1 centimeter or somebody said 10 mm, that is also correct. The majority of either an adenomatous or a cholesterol polyp have no malignant risk. True adenomatous polyp occurs in 0.3 to 0.5 percent of population. The risk of malignant transformation increases with the increasing in size of the polyp. So, any size more than 1 centimeter, the patient should undergo prophylactic laparoscopic cholecystectomy, okay. Patient is diabetic, hypertension, hypothyroid. So, all comorbids are there, 2 days of abdominal pain and the count is uh, 15,000 uh, and no fever and ultrasound shows calculus cholecystitis uh, with a pericholecystic free fluid, a perigallbladder free fluid. So, this is what the question was, uh, I mean as uh, recollected and uh, percutaneous uh, pectile, early lap coli, open coli, wait and watch. So, it is 2 days. So, so no free fluid was there. So, one was for which I should wait and watch for internal cholecystitis, should I make it? So, it was 70 years, okay fine, 70 years. 
70 years. Yeah, it is count was 14,000 is it? Okay, fine, count was 14,000. So, 14k, fine. Pericholistic fluid, yes, of course, it is there. 15 only, yeah. Hypothyroid controlled, okay. They did not ask you Tokyo classification, they asked you the treatment here. <laughs> so, you said 15 is correct, 15 is correct. No, it does, it will not come in grade 1, it will come under grade 2. It will come into moderate category. What do you say? I strongly feel the answer is um, cholecystectomy only and uh, you will uh, take up the patient because considering uh, all these factors and uh, 2 days is the key, time 2 days is the key and early lap coli will be the best choice for this patient. What do you say? So, uh, wait, wait, wait and watch an interval is okay fine. So, it does not change the answer. I feel for the given clinical situation scenario, the best answer is lap coli, early lap coli. The time factor and the patient overall looks stable. With, even with the comorbidities, it looks like that. Yeah, yeah, within 7 days. It is very, very clearly given, even Bailey also. You think that even in Bailey also it says the same. Grade 1 mild acute cholecystitis, the timing of surgery in acute cholecystitis remains controversial with many units favoring early intervention within the first week, whereas others suggest the delayed approach is preferable. Early cholestomy during acute cholestomy appears to be safe and shortens the total hospital stay, provided the operation is taken within 5 to 7 days of the onset of the attack. The surgeon has experienced and excellent operating facilities are available. Okay. Nevertheless, the conversion rate of uh, laparoscopic cholestomy is higher in acute than an elective. If the early operation is not indicated, one should uh, wait for approximately 6 weeks for the inflammation to subside before operating. See, pigtail uh, percutaneous cholecystostomy is done. If I could get a picture that it is like a gangrenous gallbladder, uh, I mean impending perforation and uh, those kind of picture we need to get that you cannot operate. See, there should be feel in the question that you mean you, you are not in a very appropriate situation to do, then you choose a, a percutaneous cholecystostomy with the pigtail. Yeah, yeah, 2 days is the key, 48 hours is the key in this question. And probably the problem here is if you do, if you leave him here and you may not catch him next day, you can go to the next complication. That is what is my worry about, about this patient. Uh, which you are looking at. So, it was calculus. Okay, this we have discussed a number of times about uh, the Tokyo consensus. So, acute cholecystitis, moderate, elevated blood count, more than 18, palpable, tender, right abdominal quadrant, duration, more than 70 hours. That was not there in the question, it was 2 days. Okay. And the marked local inflammation, gangrenous cholecystitis, pericholistic abscess was there. Here collection was there. We do not know whether it is an abscess or a collection. So, it is somewhere between mild or to moderate, something like that. So, it does not fall into moderate also 100 percent. But the question is framed that it looks like slightly a moderate from mild to moderate, something like that. It has been framed, I believe so. What do you say? Yes. So, they have just given in between. Okay, but I feel strongly the answer is lap coli, early lap coli. So, definitely calculus, then go for lap coli, you will be right. Early lap coli for this patient. If it is A calculus, I will ask you to wait. If you ask me that question, I will ask you to do a conservative management if it is A calculus. Is it okay? Calculus is surgery. A calculus, antibiotic, strong antibiotic observation, wait and watch. <laughs> is it okay? Excuse me, shall we move to the next question? Child restless regarding uh, x ray and the coin. See, the right answer is coronal plane in esophagus. Okay, that is the right answer. See this. Schwartz. <laughs> this was uh, taken from Schwartz. See, you cannot uh, completely uh, uh, say dump Schwartz. 
I, I will tell you from where Schwartz has been used. You, you can't say, uh, sir, uh, Schwartz was never used. Schwartz was also used, but not as Bailey and Sebastian. To some extent, Schwartz was also used. See this, this is how exactly it appears. So, coin and trachea, see that anterior posterior, okay. And this is lateral. And you see the coin in esophagus, see this. So, it is exactly, see that how coronal in esophagus and lateral how it appears. So, this is not only for your exam, this will be for your practice also I am telling you. Whatever the speciality you choose, you will be able to see a foreign body and this confusion even you will have in your practice as well. Now, with these images, you will definitely know to answer how it is. So, the most common foreign body in the esophagus is coin followed by small tie pots, the toddlers, the toddlers are mostly commonly affected. The coin remain in esophagus at one of the three locations. The most common will be cricopharynx, next will be arch of uh, aortic arch, next will be gastroesophageal junction of which all areas are normal anatomic narrowing. Symptoms are variable depending on the anatomic location of the foreign body and degree of obstruction. There is often a relatively asymptomatic period after the ingestion. The initial symptoms of gastrointestinal could dysphagia, drooling and dehydration. Longer the foreign body remains in the esophagus, oral secretion unable to Transit of the esophagus, greater the incidence of respiratory symptoms including cough, strider and wheezing. So, these findings may be interrupted as signs of upper respiratory tract infections. Okay. Abbey slander flap is a famous uh, repeat. So, this question does not have any value. So, whenever you see a question like this okay, and you answer as, as lip for reconstruction and uh, of course, it gives you a satisfaction of giving it right, but it is a filler, correct. It is absolutely fiddler and this has no value, this has no value. But making a mistake in this question, suppose this question is accidentally made a mistake by just clicking the options wrongly or something has happened, you will not believe it will be a disaster, it will throw out it will throw out of the competition. So, that is what you be very, of course, it has no value, but if it is by mistake, uh, error is committed here for a filler and easy question, it will make us out of the competition. So, you should be very careful on that. The central defects in the upper lip uh, are best reconstructed using an IAB flap, which is a mucosal mucocutaneous flap uh, from the lower lip based on the labial artery. The flap is transferred in staged fashion with a donor pedicle divided 2 to 3 weeks after flap insert. This, this is very, very important. 2 to 3 weeks after the flap insert. Large defect of the lower lip are reconstructed with the mucosal mucocutaneous flaps from the surrounding areas. This reconstruction should preserve motor function of the orbicularis muscle, thus ensuring a oral competency and the microstomia must be uh, produced but it is often temporary because the tissues will stretch over time. Okay, so Abbey's I mean Eslander uh, flap is a very famous uh, repeat question on lip reconstruction. Okay. Okay, penetrating injury to the heart, and I want to know is this is the only question? I mean, is this the question complete, or something else was given in the question? Because that will change the answer. See, penetrating injury is an emergency. No, no, don't answer, please. Please don't answer now was an emergency incision or thoracotomy? I mean, what was there in the question? Just recollect it. Most useful incision or emergency incision or thoracotomy. Was a thoracotomy there in the question or not? No, no. Just you tell me, in this question, was thoracotomy given or not? No thoracotomy. Okay, fine. So, then the most useful incision or the best incision. So, the question is complete. Emergency, what was there? Okay. Now, you tell me, whenever there is a stab, you see, whenever there is a stab, where will you find the stab? In the chest. Right, you do not bother because here, injury to the heart, so it is on the left side. See, most of the stab happens straight onto the chest, either this side or this side. If suppose going to be on lateral, what happens is, the lung will come into place. 
no site was given. I am just telling you, no site was given on the stab, I know, I know. But I am telling you, in general, in general, usually in a stab, it is mostly anterior that you see. Even lateral could be also there. In lateral, the lung will protect the heart. Okay, anyway, it will be there. So, I am coming straight to the point here. If it is going to be anterior, the best incision would be median sternotomy. Yes, if suppose it is going to be lateral left, then it is going to be left anterior thoracotomy. You suppose they ask you thoracotomy, there is no doubt, left anterior thoracotomy is correct. They have not asked you thoracotomy, they asked you incision. Okay. Best access to the heart is sternotomy, not thoracotomy. Yeah, penetrating, see there are two things. Penetrating, the best uh, approach is left anterolateral thoracotomy, there is no doubt about it, for the lung or for the heart. But it depends on what is injured. Suppose the anterior aspect of the heart is injured. Sternotomy is more easier than thoracotomy, understand this. So, do not be under the assumption that thoracotomy is difficult, always. Sternotomy, you will have a saw, one, I will tell you, sternotomy you can do in 30 seconds, thoracotomy will take 2 to 5 minutes. I am telling you the timing. You do not require a clamshell here. No, 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 no. That is totally different. What you are talking about in subsystem is different. You need to know here it is for the question is very specific emergency injury to the heart. So, if it is going to be heart, it will not be associated vessels and iota, everything. See, all this are related to the heart and respect to the heart, anterior medicine, ascending iota, arch, pulmonary arteries. Okay. So, I feel for this question in an emergency and uh, if an incision is preferred, thoracotomy is anterolateral, that is left anterolateral, that is different. If they ask you the incision, I will prefer my answer would be a median sternotomy. Is it okay? But do not be under the assumption that thoracotomy is faster than sternotomy, no. Sternotomy is in fact faster than thoracotomy, understand that. Because to divide the intercostals and to go on into the layers takes more time than doing a sternotomy. The answer for this will be a median sternotomy because it will give you complete exposure of the heart and the great vessels. Because anterolateral thoracotomy left, it will give you only access to the left side of the heart and your access will be limited. Clamshell incision is used only for heart lung transplant. Clamshell incision is a bilateral anterolateral, anterolateral thoracotomy with a transverse sternotomy. So, something like this. What is clamshell incision? So, you will do anterolateral thoracotomy on both the sides with the transverse sternotomy. So, this is clamshell. Okay. That is exclusively done for a heart lung transplant. Shall we move on? So, you now you would have understood the concept, what I am trying to tell you. So, based on that, you need to keep your answers. Anterolateral thoracotomy is very good for doing a cardiac massage. When you open the thorax and you can do a cardiac massage, open. So, it is very good. You can put your hand inside and do a cardiac massage. And to do minor corrections with respect to heart, I am talking about ligation of PDA, that is best will be posterior. Lateral stab incision was there. Stab to the left side and chest was there, then you should go for left anterior lateral thoracotomy. If that was there, if suppose tab was there and left side was there, it gives a clear indication to go on like that. So, it was a plain question. So, now whatever might be the question, based on that, you answer please. If, if it was there, 
if a lateral stab injury was there, something like that was given, then your answer can become left side stab, then you can go for anterolateral thoracotomy, no issues. And where uh, Bailey and Lau clearly says, okay then, I think I have discussed. I will move on to the next. 12 week gestation with a 2 centimeter lump, FNAC carcinoma, next management. First trimester. So, two things, no radiation should be given, no chemotherapy should be given. Chemotherapy can be considered after the first trimester. No axial lymph nodes, okay. No axillary lymph nodes. One option was wait for the pregnancy to complete and do MRM later. For which option I should go? For which option I should do this? Instead of which one? Instead of B. Okay. Wait till pregnancy or then do for MRM. Correct? What is this option? Complete pregnancy and do MRM. Yes? Anyway, lumpectomy followed by chemo, lumpectomy followed with axillary dissection with chemo, not an option. Only two are there. Only two are there now. Between A and B, what to choose? No, you said axillary lymph nodes are not there. No axillary lymph nodes was there. MRM plus chemo, instead of which one? MRM with axillary lymph node dissection and chemo. So, MRM with axillary dissection and chemo, you, you prefer option D, this one. All of you, you prefer option D, MRM with axillary dissection with chemo. Is that what all of you prefer? No, you can't wait till pregnancy is completed and then do an MRM. There is not an option at all. I mean that you cannot choose. See, it is a very tricky question. See, there were chemo for two questions, whatever it may be. And uh, wait till pregnancy is over, then do an MRM. Am I correct? Can I summarize like that? There are two chemo in the question. And one till wait, pregnancy is complete and do MRM. One other is terminate the pregnancy and complete. This question itself is wrong, I am telling you. Probably of the options, you can choose option D. So, it is not MRM, it is a lumpectomy with axillary lymph dissection and chemo. Is it correct? That is what you are trying to tell us. Yes, all of you. See, among the options available here, I feel D is the appropriate answer, I feel. What, what do you say? Do you agree with me? All of you? I will read and substantiate what is given in book also. No, I mean, I am sorry, you I mean this option was not there. So, you have to definitely take it off. So, the answer has to be made option D. BCS does not include lymph node dissection. Breast cancer surgery does not do axillary dissection. Breast cancer surgery includes lumpectomy, tumorectomy, quadrantectomy, void local excision. Terminate pregnancy and MRM is, uh, I think, um, is not appropriate for this patient, I feel, I believe. I will just read through this, then we will take a consensus on that. The effect of pregnancy on the breast cancer increasing, the understand it is thought that the breast cancer presenting during pregnancy or lactation tends to be at a later stage, presumably because of the symptoms are, are marked by the pregnancy. However, in other respects, it behaves similar to the uh, way the breast cancer in a non-pregnant woman and should be treated accordingly and thus treatment similar with provisions. Radiotherapy should be avoided during pregnancy, making mastectomy a more frequent option than breast conservative surgery. Okay, And breast, uh, pregnancy is one of the contraindications for breast conservative surgery. And uh, chemotherapy should be avoided during the first trimester. That, that is the reason why I was little uh, hesitant to choose uh, the options with chemo. But uh, somebody said, okay, sir, you may finish uh, one week and go to the second trimester and start doing it. Actually, in malignancy, all that are, that options are not generally taken. Okay. Most tumors are uh, hormone receptor negative, so hormone treatment. Uh, which is uh, potentially teratogenic and is not required. 
See, twelfth week is first trimester. That's it. I mean, whatever the way we can presume, we can, according to our answer, we can think that way. And end of first trimester only. Everybody knows that the purpose of giving the examiner as giving the question is to make us confused, right? So, which is potentially teratogenic and is not required. Becoming uh, pregnant subsequent to diagnosis of breast cancer appears to be alter the likely outcome. But the women are usually advised to wait at least two years. As within this time, the recurrence most often occurs. The risk of developing a breast cancer, the oral contraceptive use is only slight and disappears 10 years after stopping the oral contraceptive pill. Okay, all this is general, but not, we do not require that. Most common external intestinal manifestation of cancer was discussed in the class also. The same question is there with the picture also. So, the right answer is erythema nodosum. So, and this was very well discussed, the same question was discussed and is available in the app also. And uh, submission 21st edition 1263. Uh, Crohn's disease patient with erythema nodosum. Most common extra intestinal presentation of Crohn's are skin lesions which include erythema nodosum and pyoderma gangrenosum. Probably in sexual fluid and bloom got probably they are given something else probably, but this is what is subsistent given. I am, I am taking general surgery. Anyway, for uh, uh, Balashadari, you said, for that reason I have asked even uh, all the speciality people also to discuss in their perspectives. See, I am discussing from general surgery perspective. And the speciality people discussing general surgery in their perspective, let them come up with an answer. We will have one more discussion on this for controversies alone. Okay? After all 150, everybody has discussed, including myself, including the speciality people of uh, uh, surgical gastro or urology or onco, okay, plastic, vascular, cardiothoracic, everybody finish. Then we will take only controversies and we will have a panel discussion on that. And which book give what and what is the consensus to choose. Raynaud syndrome. The order of appearance. Again, it's a simple question. Making a mistake will throw out of us a competition. Understand that. Vijay Paul Chaudhary says PCR. That's a way to uh, remember also. PCR. That means pale, cyanosis red. Yeah, yeah, this is a repeat question. See, all these questions are available <laughs> in the material itself. You are in the learning app itself. Every explanation with this is available. That's why I said keep revising. The notes or powerpoints or just listen to the videos, it will be more than enough and sufficient for these exams. Okay. So, Raynaud's again, Bailey 967. Raynaud's disease, the idiopathic condition usually occurs in young women, affects the hands more than the feet. There are abnormal sensitivity in the arterial response to the cold. These vessels constrict and digits usually the fingers turn white, become incapable of fine movements and the capillaries then dilate. Then dilate slowly following deoxygenated blood. That means it will become cyanosis, blue, resulting in the ridges becoming swollen and dusky. As attacks passes away, the arterial relax and the oxygenated blood returns into the dilated capillaries and the ridges becomes red, rubber. Okay, paler, collar, rubber. We have discussed everything only. Parafollicular cells is a very favorite question of mine. Yes, in general surgery, in theory also I have discussed this. Okay comes via. So, this will be the neural crust, right, this will be the neural crust. So, the neural crust cells will come via the ultimo bronchial body which belongs to fifth bronchial arch and reach the thyroid gland. And the parafollicular cells are more commonly seen in the upper pole of thyroid. There is the reason why MTC, they will ask you, MTC is most commonly seen in which pole of thyroid? It is the superior pole of thyroid because it comes via the, through the superior pole, ultimo bronchial bodies, ultimo bronchial bodies. So, uh, fifth bronchial arch, ultimate bronchial blood is belongs to fifth bronchial arch, it becomes rudimentary after birth, it becomes rudimentary after birth, ultimo bronchial bodies. The only function of ultimo bronchial bodies is to carry the neural crust cells from the neural crust to the thyroid, superior pole of thyroid, such a beautiful question. It, it, I felt like one of my students has said this paper, <laughs> I am telling you, because I could see more, uh, correlate more to my teaching, so I felt that way. Okay, I will move on to the next. I do not know what image was given, uh, what is the order? So, I will tell you, I will show you the picture first, uh, then you see. See, this is the clavicle, see this is the clavicle, reference shots. Anyway, this is available in, in anatomy book also, but anyway, I, I found now in the three books, shots was giving a much better picture, so I, I took this. So, you see clavicle, next to the clavicle, you have the subclavian vein, then you have the first rib, then you have sclerosis anterior muscle. Then you have the axillary artery with the brachial plexus, then sclerosis medius. 
So it is that the axillary artery and the brachial plexus sandwiched between scalenus anterior and scalenus medius muscle. And compression of scalenus anterior on the subclavian artery is called scalenus anticus syndrome. Okay. So was this uh, question somewhere related to this is asked. So superior surface of the first rib was shown. Now you just see this picture then now you will be able to answer what was given. See medial to lateral first structure will be vein, next structure will be artery and next structure will be the nerve. Skeleton tubercle na, where scalenus anterior is attached correct. Skeleton tubercle, vein, scalenus anterior, artery, brachial plexus, scalenus medius. Okay, fine. Very clear. Shall we move on? So, it is understood, right? Whatever they have asked, you are able to correlate. Okay, fine. So, gallbladder carcinoma staging, this has been done 5 to 6 times in the class. So, it is very clear, straightforward question and there is no difficulty in all this. So, it will be T3. See, we all of us know T1A, A stands for, I always used to tell you that A stands for la, lamina propria. B, ear muscularis layer because Gallbladder does not have submucosa. So, usually 1B is submucosa. So, because gallbladder does not have a submucosa, it goes to the next layer will be muscular is layer. T2. So, it invades the perimuscular content tissue but within the serosa. So, that is how we easily remember. So, uh, subclassification of T2A, tumor inverts the perimuscular connective tissue in the peritoneal side without the involvement of the serosa, visceral peritoneum. And T2B, the tumor invades the perimuscular connective tissue on the hepatic side with no extension to the liver. So, subclassification. T3, tumor perforates uh, the serosa, so beyond serosa, directly inverts to the liver or one of the adjacent organs of the structure such as stomach, duodenum, colon, pancreas, omentum or extra hepatic bile ducts. Okay. And T4, tumor invades the main portal vein or the hepatic artery, it invades two or more extra hepatic organs of the structures. Now, T2B is a perimuscular connective tissue on the hepatic side with no extension, with no extension to the liver. But if the question you need to ascertain in the question, involving the liver bed was there or not in the question. If it is there, it is T3. Simple. No extra hepatic organ was given. Okay. Two questions were asked in the same line. Okay, fine. So, anyway, we will finish all. Okay. Two separate questions. Substance 21st edition, page number 1517. Two chemo drugs tested compared. Statistically, P value 0 0.001 and different potency, clinically both are same efficacy. What is the type of error? Type 1 error, type 2 error, alpha error, beta error. The options were all right. I have put here because I just collected from the groups. People posted to me directly and from telegram groups and various internet sources they collected. Drug has no differences but assumed there is a difference and rejected null hypothesis. Type 1 error is called an alpha error. Occurs when the researchers erroneously reject the null hypothesis and uh, interfere that difference in the outcomes when there is no difference. That is what I was, because type 1 alpha and type 2 beta, I mean why they have given like that? Because type 1 is also correct, alpha is also correct. Subistan 21st edition, page number 166. So, pretext staging based on all except. Quadrate lobe, okay. Okay, shall we look into the answers, explanation? The rest of the options are right. See, Subistan 21st edition, page number 1876. It is taken point to point and from Subistan, this question. There is no issues about it because line to line it is given. In epidoblastoma, standard TNM system has been used for staging process. But much effort has been put into development of pre-treatment staging system known as pre-treatment extent of the disease. It is called pretext definition. Pretext system was developed by International Childhood Liver Tumor Strategy Group, COPAL, for staging and risk stratification of the liver tumors. It divides the liver into four sections based on the segmental anatomy of the liver. The tumor is subsequently classified by the number of tumor free sections of the liver. This system takes caudate lobe involvement, tumor rupture, ascites, extension to the stomach and diaphragm, 
tumor focality, lymph node involvement, presence of distant metastasis, vascular involvement into the further consideration. Patient are considered at a high risk if they have a serum AFP level above 100 nanogram per ml, extension beyond the liver, distant metastasis, intrapotential hemorrhage, invasion to the hepatic veins, IVC or portal vein. For pretext 1 and 2, hepatoblastoma may be resected by segmentectomy or anatomical lobectomy. I think the answer is very clear. One little blood loss, pulse rate 104. Yes, I have discussed not once, multiple times. This is a sure shot question, definitely. Even next exam also they will ask you this. If this question is not there, Abby slander flap is not there. <laughs> this question paper is not complete. That's it. So don't feel very happy about it. So 15 to 30 percent is class two. So the matter ends there. So class one zero to 15 percent, class three 30 to 40 percent, class four more than 40 percent. Okay. Yes, of course, GCS also. Elderly male atrial fibrillation uh, in CCU in CCU complaint of abdominal pain, exploratory laparotomy done with resection of two feet of bowel length. What will be the next step? So, it is an embolus. So, it is an acute embolic manifestation and what you should do? Hepatization, revascularization of celiac and SMA and intravascular thrombolytic therapy, cardioversion. What is the answer here? To a systemic hepatination, okay. See, first gangrenous portion you have removed, then you do revascularization of celiac and SMA. Wherever the clot do an embolectomy, remove it. So, once you have done it, Okay, intraarterial thrombolysis is not here because it is not because of thrombus. Thrombus will be a chronic phenomenon. Okay, atherosclerosis and, and thrombus. And once you have done this, okay, then what you do is you hepatitis the patient because you would have either you would have done embolectomy and closed, or you would have put a stent, a bypass, so that that should not get blocked. So you start heparin after you finish everything. You will do heparinization after finish. All your procedures, surgical procedures, everything, patient, because he will bleed and die. Okay. So, once you, everything is over, stable and do a bleeding profile, then you uh, start. Then, cardioversion is also required to treat AF. That is it. Gangrenous part is already removed. So, further gangrenous should not happen, right? In the SMA dentary and celiac dentary. So, it has to be revascularized. Okay. So, who says this? I am not saying Bailey says. So, read through Bailey. Okay. So, individual hypothesis does not work, understand that. Your experience and my experience, okay, so keep it aside. Acute mesenteric occlusion, either thrombotic following, atheromatous narrowing or embolic. So, this case is an embolic, right? It is given as AF, right? So, embolic results in sudden severe abdominal pain, bowel emptying, vomiting, diarrhea, source of emboli, cardiac. Unfortunately, the diagnosis is often only made at laparotomy, widespread infarction and small large bowel present. In this situation, often fatal. Occasionally, degree of bowel infarction is more limited. So, resection of dead bowel and embolectomy of the superior mesenteric artery or a bypass surgery can reduce the otherwise high mortality rate in this patient. A second look laparotomy 24 hours later to check the viability of the bowel may be indicated. This question is taken straight from Bailey, sir. When you have to do a second look surgery after 24 hours, how do you give heparin to this patient, sir? Revascularization has to be done by removing the embolus. If not possible, put a PTFE graft. Accepted. Embolectomy is different, thrombolysis is different. Thrombolysis is a medical treatment. Embolectomy is a surgical treatment. Either you do in intra, I mean, radiation, intervention radiology or uh, by any way you have opened. That setting itself you can do. If you are not, if you are able to identify, if not, do by Intervention radiology by angiography and you try to put a catheter and try to remove the embolus through Fogarty or whatever it is. See, I, I mean, I was also looking on to some of the video presentations and some of the presentations. I mean, I feel the answers has to be evidence based. What is given in the books? Everybody have their own opinion, but what is given in the book is very important. So, I do not feel all the answers given are right. So, you have to judiciously put your mind and see what is given in the book, we follow it. It is not my answer, someone's answer, but it has to be properly from the book. So, modified shock index to accept, map by HR. For instead of which option I should put map by HR, for which option I should substitute, instead of EVA, map by HR. 
Now, is this question correct? Now, is this question framed correct? Let me read through this, then we will come to this question again as given in Subhishtan. This question is taken from Subhishtan only. Subhishtan 21st edition, page number 52. Shock index known as hemodynamic stability indica indicator. However, shock index does not consider diastolic BP. Thus, a modified shock index was created. Modified shock index defined as heart rate divided by MAP. As modified shock index rises, indicates low stroke volume and low systemic vascular resistance, a sign of hypodynamic circulation. In contrast, low MSI indicates hypodynamic state. MSI has been considered the better marker than SI for mortality rate prediction. Word to word, huh? heart rate divided by MAP. So, the answer is A. Is it okay? 80 year old male presented with a cerebellar hematoma, doctor advised conservative management cause, old age complications, hematoma more than 3 centimeter, small hematoma, no cause of edema, no not causing edema. Or the options, right? Did you remember option D also? Small hematoma not causing hydrocephalus, okay. Or midline shift. Then for all parameters, it looks like option C. Bailey and Love very clearly says, older are often anticoagulated, low energy injury leads to venous bleeding around the brain. Depending on the total volume of bleeding, the resulting hematoma may present early as acute subdural hematoma after a delay and osmotic expansion as a chronic subdural hematoma or may even clinically silent, remain silent. This later group may present much later with the future of acute and chronic subdural hematoma. On diagnosis, clotting function should be considered whenever possible bleeding of bleeds of a significant size with significant associated with significant associated midline shift or with deteriorating neurology require urgent evacuation. Smaller bleed in neurological stable patient may be managed conservatively. Initially, liquefaction of the clot over 7 to 10 days after the bleed may allow for a much less invasive evacuating through burr holes. I think option C is better, I believe. What do you say? Yes, the best possible answer is option C. Okay. PDA is from which arch? A straightforward, simple, uh, like a ABS slander flap. This question is simple or the simplest question. It is a factual question. There is nothing to discuss here. Left sixth arch, very, very important. Left sixth arch. Mixed venous saturation in septic shock. Word to word is given, very clearly given from book. It cannot come somewhere else. Very, very clear indication. Right answer is more than 70%. This was discussed in the class also. I discussed the very same question. And the same explanation, I just did a copy pasting here from the app, from the PowerPoint. So, normal mixed venous ox oxygen saturation levels are 50 to 70 percent. The levels below 50 percent indicate inadequate oxygen delivery and increased oxygen extraction of the cells. This is consistent with the hypovolemic and cardiogenic shock. High mixed venous saturation more than 70 percent are seen in sepsis and other forms of distributive shock. Tell me, how uh, more clearly can be given than this? This was taken from here only. Page number 17, 27th edition. Go to general topics, the very same question is there. Nap. Mitra clip is used for, see this is used for mitral regurgitation. See the valve, it is like a repair, it is a per string of a repair. Okay. It is application around the metal valve. So, decrease the regurgitation. Okay. So, it is called Mitra clip. Understood? The device used to reduce mitral regurgitation. The method involves suturing the 
leaflets of the mitral valve together so that the regurgitation into the left atrium is prevented. Alfre stitch is different. Alfre stitch is different. Okay. The valve continues to open to the sides of the suture. Therefore, uh, blood continues to used in MR only to decrease MR. Whatever the way ask, this is the answer. The valve continues to open through the sides of the suture. Reduce, see, used to reduce the mitral regurgitation. Very finished, very first lines over. Reduce the mitral regurgitation. See, you, you just listen to me first before you speculate things. So, the valve continues to open through the sides of the suture and uh, therefore, the blood continues to flow into the left ventricle. Although this method is less invasive, also with rapid recovery and reduced hospital stay, it is however technically demanding. Long term durability, the results of devices are unknown. So, recent data suggests that mitral is suitable for small subset of high risk patients and patients who have heart failure, okay, who are better served by surgery that leaves them substantially the less mitral regurgitation. It is not like complete like a repair or replacement, to some extent it serves. Mitra clip is to reduce MR, finished, chapter closed. MR will not be increased, MR will be decreased. See what happens is, see when the leaflet is does not approximate the blood will go into the atrium from the ventricle. This is ventricle, this is the atrium. Now, once you approximate the valve and you give a fixed, once you give a fixed opening, then the blood from LA will go to LV. Okay? It is the non cooptation of the valve causes mitral regurgitation. This technique to some extent makes the valve to coopt. So, MR is reduced. Understood? At the same time, it is not made like a stenosis. So, that it does not cause like an MS. So, still it allows the blood to flow from LA to LV. See, suppose the anterior mitral leaflet it does not approximate, it is, it is flabby. So, now what will happen? The blood from uh, during ventricular systole, the blood will regurgitate to left atrium, right? So, once you approximate, okay, then it will not 100 percent reduce, it will not 100 percent treat the regurgitation, but it will reduce, okay? So, the opening is reduced, so the MR will be reduced, that is it. So, it says it is reduce the mitral regurgitation. Gluteal region, the image was given with a sacral <laughs> pressure sore. So, it was what kind of usually it is a repeat question again. So, it is not a new question. So, it will be typically a rotation flap and this is there we have discussed this is image, this image is the same is there in the plastic surgery portion of Bailey and Law we have discussed. Please kindly go through it in the app. Okay, the very same picture. I don't know what is given in the exam, but this is about the rotational flap, gluteal rotation flap. Hypoplastic left heart syndrome. What do you mean by this? See, R A L A. So, this is LA, this is RA, this is RV and there is no LV. Hyperplastic left heart syndrome is only single ventricle. You understand what I say? Then the iota has to take from left ventricle. No, that will also be hyperplastic. The patient will survive only with PDA. So, you understand first the pathology. Hypoplastic left uh, heart syndrome is single ventricle, only the right ventricle. So, right atrium, left atrium, right ventricle, no left ventricle, hypoplastic left ventricle is. 
and the aorta that is taking origin from the left atrium, left ventricle is also hyperplastic, it will be thin. So, the patient is and the patient will be surviving only with the PDA. You understand? So, all the bilateral test to which comes from the right ventricle, which goes to the pulmonary trunk and through that it goes to the iota. One option was atrial septostomy, okay. This is also an option only. Septostomy. Now, you tell me what is the initial management? What is the key here? Now, you would have understood what I am trying to tell you. What I am trying to tell you? Which is the lifeline for this patient? Come on, do not answer. First, you tell me which is the lifeline. PDA, correct. So, it has to be kept. It has to be kept open. It has to be patterned. So, the right answer is option C. Understood? Rest of all are correct. We will come next to it. But this is the initial management. Understood? Subestern is uh, given in detail and uh, hyperplastic left heart syndrome is a single right ventricle occurs in 8 to 25 percent of 1 lakh birth, live births. Patient presents the condition of inadequate left heart structures ranging from mitral stenosis, AS, left ventricular hyperplasia to almost complete absence of left heart structures of aortic and mitral atresia. In the case of aortic and mitral atresia, the ascending aorta is typically small. That is what I was telling you, right? 1 to 2 mm. So, because left ventricle is small and ascending aorta will also be small and is perfused through the retrograde aortic arch flow provided by the PDA. So, hyperplastic left heart syndrome, the ductal closure results in rapid cardiovascular collapse. If it closes, then finish, the child will die. With a profound systemic uh, hyperperfusion hypoxia, followed by quickly by death. Therefore, in cases of prenatal diagnosis, patient must be born in a facility qualified to initiate appropriate medical management immediately, including establishment of a suitable vascular access, umbilical artery catheterization and institution of intravenous PGE1 to maintain ductal pattern C. Patients with hyperplastic left heart syndrome undiagnosed at birth typically have early grace period of few hours, but with the, with the initiation of duct closure, the child becomes critically ill and require aggressive resuscitation for survival. Although most children with hyperplastic left heart syndrome are otherwise normal without treatment. So, hyperplastic left heart syndrome is uniformly fatal condition. Okay.